So firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country in which we're meeting and acknowledge their ancestors and uh, uh, present leaders in the community. So I'm uh, talking to you about cultural awareness. Um, and I suppose I was musing as I cycled here that um, uh, the lake just to the south of, uh, of where we are at the moment used to be a major meeting point and food source for the traditional owners of the land here. And now the only remnant feature that is recognisably Aboriginal in the vicinity is a garden that's been laid out around a corroboree tree down near St Kilda Junction. And if you're a keen observer, as you wander around Melbourne, you can see residual traces of Aboriginal life. But I would say uh, there's probably uh, thousands of people in Melbourne who know about that rather than the millions who live here. And uh, as you walk around the city in Melbourne, you might be interested to know that all of the old buildings, the original buildings that were first constructed of brick in Melbourne, prior to the, um, the boom of the gold fields and all when they started to use bluestone, most of that brick was mortared with um, the shell mittens that had been along the, uh, the foreshore of the bay. They, they just saw that as, a, as a, an amazing resource and to, to reflect how long people had been living on the bay and um, uh, constructing those shell middens. Um, they were described as being 30 or 40 metres high and they provided the, the mortar for much of, of the early construction in Melbourne. And now the, um, you know, there's a nice walkway with a path and bluestone wall to stop everything washing away. And you, there's not only uh, no shell middens, there's no sand dunes either down on the front of the bay. So I worked in the Northern Territory uh, now for 30 years, um, 25 of them on location. And I still work for the Northern Territory um, by telephone and by uh, computer. We have an electronic patient health record which allows us to uh, see what's going on with any individual client in a remote health centre. So I still do uh, shifts in that space. And I just wanted to talk about um, a little bit of uh, the background and context of uh, Indigenous health, uh, a little bit about health status and outcomes. I'm sure most people are familiar with them and also the determinants of health. Some information about health system performance, uh, the role of public health in Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health and innovations and success stories. One of the things that I think is most telling uh, about the vision statement of the National Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Health Plan is that the first sentence calls for the Australian health system to be free of racism and inequality and that all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people have access to health services that are effective and of high quality. So that's effectively an acknowledgement by the government, whose document this is, that we're not there yet. And clearly there's a lot of uh, subgroups of Australian society who suffer discrimination and racism and who experience inequality in their interactions with the health service. But for most Aboriginal people, that has major implications for their health care. Um, and it's an ongoing issue uh, for most people every day. So colonisation is not just an historical event, it does have an ongoing impact. It can be thought about in terms of the losses, language, land, culture. And in the Northern Territory, for instance, um, 
quite a bit of the land, more than 50% is actually uh, Aboriginal land. However, it's held in trust. So it's not freehold land. It's not ownership in the style that allows people to economically exploit it. They have to sit back passively and wait for others to economically exploit it like miners and, and uh, pastoralists. So the Central Land Council, for instance, uh, took a major stand against the introduction of the, um, or, or after the um, Mabo and Wick decisions, to try and actually convince the government to purchase uh, pastoral properties so that they had the benefits of freehold land. And to a certain extent that has happened. But a lot of people look at the Northern Territory and say, well, it's Aboriginal people up there, they own 50% of the land, but actually it's not land that they can exploit economically. And not surprisingly, they continue to exist uh, in, a, in poverty uh, as a major issue. There's active discrimination, and that leads to lower levels of attainment in education, health, employment, have lower access to housing and health services. And there's also flow on effects um, from discrimination and inequality, reduced food security. When I first went to live and work in Darwin, I used to make a habit of visiting every remote bush store that I, um, for the communities that we visited and lived in. And the two things that were instructive were to have a look at the fruit and veggie shelf and to have a look in the meats, the meat freezer. Because um, uh, in large measure, most of what was available wasn't, would not never have been acceptable in Darwin. Um, so for instance, the, the meat that was being sold in the Aboriginal communities was high fat, low quality, unable to be sold in Darwin. But if it's the only meat that's in the freezer in a remote community, people don't have a choice. So they would buy it at an elevated price. Um, not surprisingly, in common with most people for whom poverty is an inescapable uh, reality, drug and alcohol issues are a major feature. However, what's less well known is that the number of Aboriginal people or well, the portion of the Aboriginal adult population who actually drink alcohol is lo the lowest of any community in Australia. The problem is that there are a significant number of people who do drink alcohol and most or many of those people actually drink to harmful levels. However, there are the majority of Aboriginal adults don't drink alcohol at all. There are mental health issues associated with colonisation and an Aboriginal psychiatrist in Western Australia has been very uh, active in describing uh, the impact of that on the current generation of Aboriginal people living in Western Australia. And I think that's, uh, I've got a, a paper that just refers to some of those references. So perhaps you can have a look at that. And chronic disease, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. <coughs> The WHO definition, which has stood the test of time, um, talks about physical, mental and social well-being. And you don't, no one needs to explain that to an Aboriginal person because that's always what they thought health was. And the, the interesting thing is that when that's actually operationalised, as opposed to thought about, which is what it's like in, for most non-Aboriginal people, um, it means that on occasions personal health care for the individual is not seen as important as some other social or cultural obligations. So the, the, um, the three themes that emerge from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander history in Australia 
uh, denial of humanity, where people were seen as being subhuman, denial of existence, terra nullius, and denial of identity. So those things still continue to have an impact today. And there's very real manifestations and implications. There is a well-documented massacre of two-thirds or three-quarters of the Yabarara people uh, in the Pilbara in 1868. It was commemorated last year, the 150th anniversary of that massacre by the surviving Yabarara people. One thing that was less known was that the land in which they lived has the highest number of petroglyphs of anywhere in the world. The, um, there's been some anthropologists and archaeologists documenting some of those. They've documented 20 or 30,000 of the petroglyphs. Uh, the academics estimate there's probably 300,000 currently there, but uh, others have estimated that it might be as many as a million petroglyphs. This area, the, the Borough Peninsula, is the nearest land based, uh, the nearest land accessible to the Northwest Shelf. So when they were exploiting the gas fields in the Northwest Shelf in the 1960s, it was the obvious place to build their gas trains. And 25% of that area was bulldozed and turned into an industrial landscape without any, uh, without any assessment of its Aboriginal historical uh, archaeological worth. And it's only been very recently, in the last 10 years, I think it is, uh, actually Malcolm Turnbull was Minister for uh, Environment and Science, uh, uh, actually nominated it to the UNESCO Heritage Re Register. Up until that time, it wasn't protected at all. And it's a reflection, that would never have happened if those were non-Aboriginal relics, non-Aboriginal archaeological sites. But it's the, the people who had the traditional ownership of that land had been virtually wiped out 150 years ago and they survived by keeping their head down because it's still a hostile environment for them. And it's only been the last five, sorry, <coughs> the last 10 years since the nomination of the National Register that um, those people have had any access to um, economic advantage in trying to develop cultural tours to the, to the Barrett Peninsula. Of course, at night, there's still the glow of the largest <coughs> liquid natural gas train in the Southern Hemisphere. Um, sitting on the peninsula, but at least people have now got access. They're standing stones that are part of the petroglyphs and all over Europe, people understand standing stones as being uh, items of great significance and they chose to ignore those standing stones when they came to Australia. Now, of course, um, this is a pretty um, familiar uh, graph for people to see of the, the, um, the pyramid for <coughs> Aboriginal people comparing it to uh, non-Indigenous people, where there's a predominance of people in the young, the, uh, the young age groups and far fewer in the older age groups. So where, as, as I was um, 
we, we, we've had quite a bit to do with trying to develop health services for remote communities and usually the way you do it is to talk with the community and the, uh, the elders to start with. And one question I had when I was um, uh, when I was first trying to explain to people uh, what are the things that we need to achieve is that uh, we actually need more old people to die because we need people to get to them to old age before they die. And um, it, there was a, uh, it seems like a strange thing to say, but that stuck in people's minds and they actually understood it and related it to people. They, they, uh, they knew all about young people dying and they didn't know very much about old people dying. So one thing that um, uh, is, is an issue is that people do surveys of health status and a bit like uh, what people are discovering with the modern day approach to surveys of voters' intentions, it's pretty unreliable. Or be, it's probably always been pretty unreliable with Aboriginal people, but in the move from um, uh, fixed phone polling to mobile phone polling, um, there's only a very select subgroup of people who actually answer their mobile phones to strangers. <laughs> so, uh, so it's not a it's not a representative of the the national of the, the major population any longer, and so polling is uh, very unreliable. Uh, but Aboriginal people often describe a feeling of being sad in their heart and anxious when there's trouble in the community or in the family. Um, and, and often cultural and family obligations come first. And attending to one's own personal health needs may be less important. The implications of that is that um, taking own leave from hospital is a major issue in the Northern Territory and in other communities where there's um, uh, significant Aboriginal populations. It's just that because the Northern Territory is uh, uh, so many of the hospital population are Aboriginal, it's very obvious there. But it actually happens in Melbourne as well. Um, it's just that the implications of it aren't, aren't so obvious. And so I'm on the, um, the Clinical Advisory Committee for the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority. And it's a, it's been very useful to actually um, try and get people to understand in the national data what are the issues that actually pertain to Aboriginal people because they get totally lost in every jurisdiction other than the Northern Territory. So we can actually look at those features and then look at uh, the subgroups in the rest of the population and try and understand them. So in the Northern Territory, about 10% of Aboriginal patients take their own leave during a hospital admission. Most of the rest of the country, it's less than 1% of, of uh, hospitalised persons take their own leave. And usually if you ask why they do that, I mean, if you ask the average uh, staff member of a hospital, a nurse or a doctor, it'll be because they were wanting to, you know, they just were no good, nobodies, just wanted to leave. Uh, I'm being a bit provocative. Um, but the reality is, if you ask people why, there'll often be something very important they have to do today, tomorrow and the day after, but they'll be willing to come back the day after that. And so, certainly in the Northern Territory, that, that's well understood. And people do come back and, and have their health services. And when we work in remote health, um, we often have to negotiate when we're going to transport someone to a hospital. We think they should go to hospital 
preferably yesterday, uh, but they know that they can't go until Sunday night or whatever. Uh, you know, they'll they'll work it out, and so that's just the reality. It's the landscape we work in. But there's not the flexibility in most other hospital environments for for that to take place, and. When people take their own leave from a hospital in the Northern Territory, they're not immediately discharged. Usually they're given 12 or 24 hours or 36 hours, or it might be even negotiated to be longer. Whereas if you walk out the door at St Vincent's or, uh, you know, the Alfred up the road, you there's someone else in your bed. So, uh, and then the reverse is... Uh, is true also from the point of view of people's interpretation of uh, health status. If everything's pretty good in the community uh, and you actually ask someone how they're going, they'll say excellent or good. And in fact, Aboriginal people who have been surveyed with the lifestyle questionnaires often come out with a higher self-assessed health status than the rest of the population. Uh, and that's because they're reflecting not their own personal health challenges, they're reflecting how things are going in the community. Um, so... And I would argue that white people do the same thing, it's just that their communities are not healthy. They're not consciously doing it, but, but they're unhappy and their life is reflecting poorly on those because actually that is because of their communities too. Oh, yeah, but all I'm saying is when you when you apply the same uh, the, the, the same criteria um, that that uh, the, the self assessment of, of, of the Aboriginal people in certain not all because they've improved the way they ask the questions, but in the um, yeah, if you look back ten fifteen years ago, uh, often the self assessments were considerably higher for Aboriginal people than for non-Aboriginal people, in spite of the fact that, you know, they're ignoring their amputations and their dialysis and things. Um, and, and often um, Australian culture has been very unable to embrace and understand and learn and benefit from having the oldest continuous culture. Um, obviously, there's been people who have worked in the non-health se sector who've learned a lot about animals and plants and fire regimes and fish and uh, you know, all, all sorts of uh, things in the physical world where eventually the other sciences caught on and, and tried to mine the knowledge of Aboriginal people. Um, in health, we've been less uh, able to do that. Um, there's been use of nunkeries in, in a number of health centres and hospitals in the Northern Territory, and recently there was talk about nunkeries in Northern South Australia. But in general, um, we haven't really taken advantage of uh, traditional knowledge in the health sphere. And, um, and yet, uh, clearly, there's a lot to learn. Um, the, there has been some work done on the traditional knowledge of the health practitioners. Uh, Elkin wrote a book, Aboriginal Men of High Degree, trying to link the, uh, the knowledge and understanding, the specialist knowledge and understanding of, of people who've basically studied all their lives, because that's a, effectively what those traditional people uh, did, to uh, non-Aboriginal people attending university. Um, obviously, one of the uh, major initiatives in the last 15 years in Australia has been the closing the gap uh, approach. Um, I'd have to say uh, there's 
the, the many of the approaches that are documented in the closing the, the gap strategy suffer from the traditional approach of, of being a top-down uh, initiative. However, there are buried in the closing the gap reports, there are actually some quite inspiring local initiatives which have been supported and included. So it's worth having a look at uh, each of those reports. They've, they change their focus each year and of course they want to try and trawl for positive stories to include in their report, but those, those stories nonetheless are worth reading. Um, so very few of the close the gap targets have actually been achieved um, in education, uh, in cities and regional services, they've been managing to get four year olds into early childhood education, but the rest of the gaps have not been achieved. Likewise, employment uh, is of major significance and um, to one thing to note is if there's a history of incarceration, uh, the employment rate for people is um, less than half what it is if there's no history of incarceration. Um, and females are, have a higher rate of employment than males, but um, the gap is lower, uh, sorry, is, is greater. Um, but the majority of people who are of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander descent who are in their workforce are working in lower paid jobs. Uh, the life expectancy gap hasn't been achieved. Um, chronic disease has shown some significant improvement, uh, but the cancer gap is widening as mortality rates rise. Just, um, uh, just to look at mortality rates by um, jurisdiction, um, clearly uh, Western Australia and the Northern Territory have got a lot to uh, work on. Um, and in part that's a reflection of uh, the mortality rate experienced by people who live in remote locations for both Indigenous and non-Indigenous persons and that in the Northern Territory in Western Australia um, a significant, well in the Northern Territory a majority of Aboriginal people live in remote and very remote locations and in Western Australia a significant portion of the population lives in remote and very remote locations. But um, uh, but yes, there's certainly a lot to be um, to be done in many of those areas. And if we look at the risk factors that contribute to the health gap between Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander and non-Indigenous people, um, this was this report or this view of of the gap was actually championed by Tom Tom Karma. He's uh, been at great pains to try and point out to people that actually uh, tobacco is an issue for um, Aboriginal people and it's a major, uh, uh, has a major impact on their health status. But um, in fact, when you look at the lowest, um, the lowest percentile of uh, income, in Australia and in many countries, but particularly in Australia, uh, that's the group who have the highest smoking rates. It doesn't matter whether you're Aboriginal or, or Torres Strait Island or non-Indigenous. If you're poor, you're much more likely to smoke. And so in some way, the rate of smoking in Indigenous communities being so high is actually a reflection of them being a uh, a level below the, uh, the, the mark for, um, uh, in terms of poverty. And likewise, obesity is an issue of poverty. And physical inactivity is a challenge um, 
for all people in society and unfortunately it is for people even in remote communities as well. Um, Just going back to that, what, what role do you think the social determinants and cultural determinants have a role in the health outcomes alongside the biomedical things that we just looked at? Well, I suppose um, these are... Um, the Northern Territory Health Gains Planning Unit uh, did a, uh, an analysis of cult the cultural determinants of health. Uh, basically, 46% of the gap is thought to be associated with poverty. And uh, poverty has an impact on these biomedical determinants. And probably a large portion of those first three columns is actually related to poverty. So, uh, but that's an analysis that hasn't been universally accepted by people, although it's been published by Health Gains Planning. Um, there's been people who've criticised it, but it's, it's out there and it's difficult to see any other, uh, you know, there's no equivalent ability to, um, to look at that in other jurisdictions. So, um, so yes, I, I agree that probably poverty is the largest single factor. And obviously, um, if you look at the years of potential life lost, um, uh, apart from the uh, childhood and young adulthood uh, or infants up to f uh, less than five years of age, uh, people are really experiencing an excess burden of mortality, um, particularly over the, the, the life of that uh, most productive period of people's lives, which has a major impact. It has a major impact on the um, I suppose on the drive, the effectiveness and the functionality of society when you're losing the, that group who are some of the most educated and able, um, then, then that has a major impact on uh, the rest of the country, uh, the rest of uh, society. So there are some useful strategies that have been promoted and funded as part of the Closing the Gap strategy. Um, school nutrition is one. Uh, there's been a focus on sport and active life, lifestyles. There's been a very effective um, uh, implementation of tobacco workers and, rem and a remote alcohol and other drugs workforce. When I first started to to do some work in remote communities. There was a survey done which was focusing on renal health, but one of the things that it looked at was the um, associated health li and lifestyle factors. And uh, of a community of 360 adults, there were only, there were 80% were smokers and there were only two ex-smokers. So smoking cessation just wasn't a feature of Aboriginal life in remote communities in the Northern Territory when I first went up there. Whereas now it's quite common to have people who are ex-smokers, although in some communities in East Arnhem Land, there's still adult smoking rates in the 60% prevalence level, down from 85%. Uh, and petrol sniffing has been very largely controlled uh, through the Closing the Gap strategy with the rollout of opal fuel. Um, and, and one of the things uh, that people from the Aboriginal community criticised about Closing the Gap was that the Aboriginal community is not a single uniform uh, group. And therefore, 
the strategies need, need to be strengths based and locally rooted, preferably local origin. Um, and quite a few of those small local uh, factors, uh, lo local programs, have actually been successful. As I said, they sort of harvest them to promote them in the, in the report. Uh, one excellent program which has had up and down success over the years in trying to deal with, sorry. Oh, sorry, I just got to the previous slide where you talked about some of the critiques of the closing the gap. Um, there has been a lot of critiques, particularly that saying that the closing the gap is sort of maybe um, playing towards government demands rather than Indigenous aspirations. And the one thing I'm wondering is about the representation of statistics, not just in terms of grouping Indigenous people as a homogenous group, but what about the constant comparison between non-Indigenous people? Like, how do you think that representation um, maybe doesn't actually sort of really support the efforts of the closing the gap by constantly comparing to non-Indigenous people? Uh, look, I, I think um, the, the whole approach to closing the gap was going to be totally rethought uh, by the government that didn't make it. Um, <laughs> because uh, there are all sorts of issues with it. One of the things is uh, to, to be aware of is that uh, there has been some, some good programs developed in communities that have been funded as a result of closing the gap, funds being available that are uh, doing a great job. Uh, overall, I think the focus of um, First of all, that, that the notion of closing the gap is one that's um, that would be better off almost to to think about in the background rather than to make it a foreground issue. Um, and uh, working to um, to try and enable um, local people to. Um, to actually run programs, develop programs, is critical. And I think, I think the focus on the statistics and the focus on the, um, the gap itself is very negative. Um, because one of the things is, uh, in the case of the Northern Territory, for instance, the gap between people who live in remote locations alongside Aboriginal people and the Aboriginal people is not very big in most areas. We, so, so the gap, the, the, the focus on, of it on, the, on a sort of top level gap uh, actually ignores the fact that a lot of Aboriginal people in the Northern Territory at least prefer to live in remote locations. And as a result, they trade off access to a variety of things, including health services and education. And so people actually choose that. And, um, and other people who choose to live on those, in those locations like cattle property workers and others also suffer reduced health status. So the, the, the pan-indigeneity pan argument uh, is also relevant for the way in which you interpret the statistics of um, the rest of the country because the majority of people who are non-Aboriginal live in cities and have got, you know, major public hospitals just around the corner. But when you look at the stats nationally, nationally the, yeah. the majority of Indigenous people live in cities. Yeah. And I also, I kind of question that, that comment about it's a choice to live remotely because actually I don't think it's, I think I kind of place that lifestyle choice debate that happens and I think it's actually more about wanting to be on country. So I don't know that it's necessarily a choice to not have access to health services. No, well, in, in the Northern Territory, uh, where people do live um, in remote communities, in fact, they've got access to excellent health services. I mean, they've got excellent access to health services because they've got remote health centres. But once you start to get to homelands movements, uh, that becomes like utopia, for instance. There's been you know, a lot of documentation about the health benefits of living in utopia over three decades. Um, but that's only got a couple of health centres and it's got 30 or 40 living areas. So people 
choose to live on their country and and be able to drive you know sometimes 40 minutes an hour to to a regional health center or a couple of hours to the central health service so there's um i know the majority of aboriginal people live in uh the city but i'm just saying that uh, there's a very significant portion of Aboriginal people who don't live in the city, who live in remote locations in Queensland, Western Australia and the Northern Territory, and to a certain extent in New South Wales with Will Kenya and the like. And uh, that the, the analysis of Aboriginal health, um, that's a much higher portion of people compared to non-Indigenous people who, who are exposed to those risk factors. Perhaps also worth noting that some people who um, choose to live in choose to live in those circumstances actually would have um, yeah much and I, I know I understand that there's a particular focus at the moment on you know some devastating consequences of suicide in particular areas but also a number of people who decide to live in traditional lands actually um, are going to have probably much higher self-assessed health status and are actually maybe having improved mental and social health outcomes in some ways, despite poor social, poor um, physical health outcomes from lack of services. So just being in line with what you were saying. Yeah. So uh, certainly there's been, there's been an argument about uh, where housing needs to be built um, and whether it should be built in regional towns rather than, than uh, on country. And uh, the approach that was that has been taken as a result of the consultations is that they continue to the Aboriginal community continues to want housing to be built on country, as that's a major barrier to people living out there. So it is uh, it's it's not a simple issue in terms of, and it's probably varies according to just about every community you look at in detail. Did you have a, another question? Or no, I, I'm making a note. So the, just the, the Housing for Health program, um, it's, had, it's had a, a launch in 89, um, showed that they could do wonderful things and then the program was no longer funded and then it had it's had a series of of uh lives um and ironically uh, a year or two after the apology um the Rudd <coughs> government actually defunded the housing for health program and closed it down uh, However, it then sub subsequently um, was reincarnated and it uh, has actually continued to um, survive. But um, the, it's just mind boggling what people find when they go and survey houses. Um, the Housing for Health program, if you're not familiar with it, um, basically uh, they recruit uh, local Aboriginal people in communities, train them up to um, to do a survey of the house, train people up to fix the uh, the things that don't need technical uh, or trade qualifications, and then uh, within the housing for health program there are a couple of Aboriginal tradesmen who work as well. Uh, but yeah, just on a basic survey, they you know they find that. 10% of houses in, uh, in their two, 2017 results weren't electrically safe. And only, uh, only just over a third had a working shower and uh, um, only 6% had working kitchens. So uh, there's, there's mind boggling um, dysfunction when it comes to uh, health hardware. Um, in in remote communities, and 
the, the Housing for Health program doesn't survey without fixing. So 100% of those faults were remedied as a part of the, the program. But it's, um, it is mind-boggling that, that the degree of dysfunction is allowed to accumulate um, when it comes to important health hardware. So, um, sorry, it's probably not there. So 78% of the staff employed on the Housing for Health program are local community staff. So, um, so I mean, I don't want to um, ram this down your throat, but racism in health is a major impact on health outcomes. And, um, and it can be either direct or ind indirect. Um, internalised by the recipient if it's, uh, you know, it will often be the way in which people deal with it. Um, there's sometimes over interpersonal racism and there's sometimes systemic racism. Uh, in public hospitals, it's been extensively documented that outcomes are unequal for Indigenous and non-Indigenous patients. And, and so, for instance, Joan Cunningham um, did a survey of uh, back in 2002 that showed public hospital patients admitted with the same diagnosis were much less likely to have a principal procedure recorded against them if they were Indigenous. Sorry, just in reference to racism and health, is that a confound of racism in our communities or is that inbuilt into the health? Do you know what I'm saying? It's both. Yeah. institutional racism, it's on a personal level, it's a community level. Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's what like, they so that's what Where I, do we target it as professionals, I guess? Every level. Yeah, it's, well, as I said, it, you know, it's direct or it's indirect. Uh, it can be overt. And, and one of the things that I think public health physicians can do is to try and look at what's systemic, because a lot of systemic stuff can be fixed. I think it's really, like, I think you said, you mentioned about ramming it down our throats. I don't think you are at all. I think it's really good that you're talking about the R word because we're so scared to talk about it. But racism is a major contributor to poor health outcomes. And so, like, I commend you for talking about it. So thank you. Well, the interesting thing is that Indigenous patients in private hospitals, there was no difference in procedure rates. <coughs> so... Um, and that's in Joan Cunningham's work from 2002. The, um, and, and only 80% of, of Aboriginal people in Queensland, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, were likely to have a revascularisation procedure for an AMI. Um, and there was increased mortality rates associated with that re reduced rate of revascularisation procedure. I know that uh, in Central Australia, there's, when this paper was first done, there was a look at what was going on at Alice Springs Hospital, a very small hospital with the majority of people who were um, Aboriginal as their patients. So most, they, they did a bit of a survey of the hospital staff and they said, oh, no, no, no racism uh, occurs here. And then they looked at what the outcomes were and they're very similar to that paper from 2002. Um, and, and there were a number of Aboriginal people in Central Australia who said, who were health practitioners, some public health physicians, who said, we're going to fix that because it was a small hospital, they know all the people and they thought they'd work on it. They did improve the rate of procedures carried out for Aboriginal people. But for all the reasons I mentioned earlier, there's never going to be exactly the same rate of procedure uh, for Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal people in Alice Springs Hospital, uh, at least not in the foreseeable future. Uh, but in spite of the fact that most people who work there are interested in Indigenous health and regard themselves as not racist and not... Uh, you know, really trying to improve outcomes. Uh, 
there was a systemic difference even in Alice Springs Hospital. And that was able to be partly remedied by increased efforts and increased understanding um, by the clinicians and increased training by the clinicians to, um, to change their attitudes because systemic racism was real. So births and pregnancy outcomes, obviously there's a much higher rate of teenage pregnancy. This, this data is a bit out of date, but um, uh, it's uh, I think five years out of date. Um, <coughs> I was a bit surprised about that. We, in, uh, we certainly were quick to embrace Implanon in, uh, uh, in remote health, um, and it's been very effective in reducing the teenage pregnancy rate. However, um, obviously these are figures for Australia-wide. Premature and low birth is still nearly twice the uh, non-Indigenous average. And, um, <coughs> If you look at the biological um, outcomes, um, clearly the Barker hypothesis, um, uh, where what you're born with, if you're subjected to stresses in the uterus or born prematurely or small, uh, sets you up or um, makes your uh, kidneys and your heart to a certain extent um, and your pancreas, your islet cells at risk of um, running out of energy or running out of numbers uh, during the course of your life and you're much more likely to suffer chronic diseases of renal impairment and diabetes if you're born premature and then are subsequently an overweight uh, adult. And antenatal care is much less likely to occur in the, in the first trimester and the antenatal tendencies are likely to be lower. So the Redfern Aboriginal Health, uh, Aboriginal Medical Service was actually established as a result of desperation by the Aboriginal community that they couldn't get access to general practitioners who understood their situation. However, it's been an initiative that has um, benefited the rest of the population as well because people have been able to learn from it. But there's now 139 Aboriginal medical services, uh, including now three in Melbourne. Um, and the community control of the primary health care services has actually been an important initiative to, um, to create health services that are culturally safe and that people feel able to use. But hospitalisations still occur at a much greater rate than um, than the non-Indigenous population. However, 45% of those episodes are actually hemodialysis. Um, in primary care, um, there certainly are numerous health challenges. Dental care is almost universal in remote communities these days. And uh, my uh, contacts who work in Aboriginal health in Melbourne say so it's very, very common here too, in spite of the fact that there's fluoride in the water in Melbourne. Cardiovascular disease, diabetes and chronic kidney disease have been major features of the last 25 years. Cancer is emerging as a major illness. Respiratory health has uh, certainly been um, taking its toll in Aboriginal communities. Uh, rheumatic heart disease gets a special gong because it has such a major implication on the health of um, young people. Uh, I think everyone knows what the um, standard infectious diseases are. Um, certainly, uh, bloodborne viruses are, are uh, major issues. Uh, hepatitis B, hepatitis C and HTLV1, which is a problem for Aboriginal people in Central Australia, are bloodborne viruses that are major issues. And because of the, um, the, the I'd have to say um, 
stepping into an Aboriginal health service, and the first one I visited was uh, Victorian Aboriginal Health Service when it was located in Gertrude Street in Fitzroy many years ago. But this is true of everyone I've been in ever since. Um, uh, there's no doubt that you can think of ways of improving the way you do health services. And I tell people, we've all worked and trained in public hospitals and you can't help but escape with the same conclusion. You, must, you can step into a public hospital and it only takes you five minutes to see things that might be done better. So there's always a, 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 an approach, a public health approach, that is uh, of benefit to the delivery of health services and hopefully the health care outcomes. Um, certainly embracing standards, evidence and, and the implementation of evidence is a major issue that health services haven't done well and the public health uh, community needs to promote. Embracing evaluation and program redesign is required and certainly in the clinical space, uh, participate in the use of protocols and standard treatments. Uh, just in terms of uh, embracing new technology, um, when video conferencing first started to emerge as a, as a tool that might be used by health services, we were contacted by um, uh, by people in South Australia and a variety of private companies who wanted to try and uh, encourage the use of video conferencing in the Northern Territory, uh, saying that it was going to change our lives. Um, we pointed out that actually with 78 remote health centres um, in the Northern Territory, uh, telemedicine had been a way of life for a long time. And in fact, uh, the first documented Health consultation was between Hargrave, um, Hargrave, the postmaster in Alice Springs, and a doctor at the Adelaide Hospital in 1907 via Morse code to, uh, when someone was thrown out of a um, bullet drain, had a fractured femur. So it's been part of our the way in which we do our job. Um, Public health has had major benefits in the approach to, uh, uh, sorry, I'll just go on. Sorry, I'll just. One of the things that we've been able to um, achieve with public health approaches is to develop shared electronic health records that, uh, that are actually population focused as well as capable of delivering individual clinical care. And that's been a major benefit. And along with the, um, I don't know with, if many of you are familiar with the general practice collaboratives that ran for a number of years, um, where practices were encouraged to collect and analyze their data in a group setting and they were provided some assistance by the collaborative team to do so. We set up a, basically a, an Aboriginal health uh, collaborative in the Northern Territory involving the uh, community controlled and the government sector. And they analyse their data on a regular basis. They have regular um, uh, meetings and that really helps with um, the improvement of clinical care. So for instance, we're able to produce uh, reports that demonstrate not only that the processes are happening at a very high rate, over 90%, blues the systolic blood pressure, uh, pinks cholesterol, greens, HbA1c, uh, the yellow is the albumin creatinine ratio. And this is uh, this is data from 8,600 odd diabetic patients for the Northern Territory. So over 90% of them had had the process, appropriate process of care during the previous three months. Uh, the bars there indicate uh, who's been offered the appropriate um, 
uh, intervention in terms of medications, um, the outcomes are able to be assessed for those who actually achieve the target outcome who are on the medication. The gap is the people who fail to achieve the targets who aren't on the medication um, and the inertia who, sorry, the, the people who are on the medication but haven't yet achieved their, uh, their target goals. And the inertia represents the group who were um, uh, declining to take medication for one reason or another and uh, what their... Um, what percentage of them had failed to meet targets. So the public, it's not a general practice approach, it's not a hospital approach, this is a public health approach that actually allows us to, uh, to, to roll up this data, to analyse it, to feed it back to the primary healthcare clinicians and encourage improvement in healthcare outcomes. And I just wanted to share a little bit of a story. Uh, working in Aboriginal health in the Northern Territory has been one of the greatest privileges of my life and it's one of uh, the most interesting um, jobs you could possibly imagine. I was camping with a, a bunch of Tiwi people on, the Mel on Melville Island and uh, we were driving back from a waterhole and I was the last vehicle and I saw this beautiful carpet snake on the road and I stopped to take a photograph of it. And when I finally got back to camp, they asked me why I was late. You know, they thought well, I might have had a flat tyre or something. I said, oh, no, I'll show you this photo. And I'm firing up the camera and showing them the photo on the screen. And before I knew it, I was standing by myself in a, in a cloud of dust with the sound of doors slamming because people said, where did you see it? <laughs> and they took off, <laughs> left me standing in the dust, and that was breakfast the following morning. <laughs> and they couldn't really figure out why I'd only taken a photo of it. <laughs> and I was, you know, they, they said, clearly he doesn't have the ability to be a hunter. <laughs> so, so it is a two-way um, learning experience and you have to open yourself to, uh, to that. How did it taste? <laughs> I didn't get near it to eat it. It was, it was uh, cooked in the coals overnight and uh, consumed before sunrise the next morning. Thank you very much.